Previously on Robot Cantina. Well, somehow we managed to get this two-cylinder 670cc powered vintage Renault up to 55 miles per hour in 35.60 seconds. Now, if you're new to the channel, you might be thinking that sucks, and yeah, taking a half minute to get up to the double nickel ain't very impressive for a normal car, but this ain't a normal car. And again, if you're new to the channel, well, prepare to have your mind blown. Yup, we did the 0 to 55 while starting off in third gear. Yeah, let that sink in. Now, if you want to learn more about this car, it's recommended that you watch our previous episodes to understand how we modified the transmission. However, the short story is, the transmission we're using is a combination of a CVT and a 4-speed manual gearbox. Now, I'm not going to get into the rest of the details. You'll have to watch the previous episodes if you want to catch up. Anyway, our goal with this vintage 1969 Renault is to get the car to go as fast as possible with a tiny lawnmower engine. A few moments ago, I mentioned that we got the Renault up to 55 miles per hour in 35.60 seconds, and while that's not great by any standards, it's a huge improvement. You see, we've been diligently working on this car doing simple modifications, and we slashed the acceleration time from 51 seconds down to 35 and a half seconds. So if you do the math, we shaved about 15 and a half seconds off the time it takes to get to 55 miles per hour. Now that ain't bad for an 1800 pound car with a 670 cc engine. So this project is all about speed, and when you're building a race car like ours, well, fuel economy is going to suffer. Previously, the best fuel economy we were able to get was 37 miles to the gallon while driving around the back roads here in rural Kansas. And after we did some modifications to the engine, well, the fuel economy dropped to 35.5 miles per U.S. gallon. So even though fuel economy is definitely not our number one concern, today we're going to see if it can be improved, and if we're lucky, we might actually improve the performance as well. So to improve the fuel economy, we're going to focus entirely on the engine, and that's because this car is shaped like two bricks, and there ain't anything we can do about aerodynamics. Well, to be clear, there ain't anything we can do that wouldn't drastically alter the classic appearance of this somewhat vintage car, so we're not going to play with the aerodynamics. Now, I propose we start off today's experiment by possibly doing something stupid. And the reason I say that might be stupid is, some people have suggested we try this experiment, and others have said it's a bad idea. Well, if you haven't noticed, putting a lawnmower engine in a car ain't exactly a great idea, so let's try something that nobody seems to be able to agree on. Here, let me take some of this stuff apart, and I'll show you what we're going to do. Alright, this is the intake manifold on our two-cylinder engine, and as you can see, the engine has two ports, and each of the ports feeds each of the cylinders. Let me put some of these parts back together for a moment. So with the intake manifold sort of in place, we can see that each of the ports are separated from each other, and that's a shame. Now, let's take a look at the carburetor. And as some of you folks may already know, this engine uses a two-barrel carburetor, and each side of the carburetor feeds a single cylinder. Now, on this carburetor, each of the barrels are 28 millimeter, or just over an inch. So what would happen if we rigged up some kind of a gizmo that did away with the separation and combined both barrels? You know, it may be a good idea, and it may be a bad idea. It's really hard to say. Well, combining both barrels effectively doubles the size of the carburetor to a certain extent. Now, this is going to be a simple experiment, and due to the limited space, and to avoid making things very complex, I'm suggesting that we construct a spacer that will go between the carburetor and the manifold. And, this spacer will allow cross-flow between the two sides of the carburetor. Now, it ain't going to be perfect, and I'm well aware of that, but keep in mind this is a simple experiment, and based on the results from this experiment, we can determine if this is the right direction to go. So, to build the part we need, we could grab a chunk of aluminum and a bunch of tools, and before you know it, we would have a nice aluminum spacer. But, that's not what we're going to do. Instead, I'm going to 3D print the part we need from ASA Plastic. Now, it took me a total of 25 minutes to design this part in Tinkercad, and almost two hours for the robot to print it. Man, it's nice living in the robot age. 
August is our subscriber month and we're trying to reach our goal of 1 billion subscribers. If you're not already subscribed, well, please consider subscribing. We have Operator Standing By, which has absolutely nothing to do with subscribing. Actually, to subscribe, just click on the subscribe button. It's easy and of course it's free. Plus, as a subscriber, you'll enjoy all the benefits of being a subscriber. Now, back to our story. So here's the 3D printed spacer, and as you can see, the area between the throttles has been opened up. Now, there ain't a lot of space for crossflow in this 6mm thick spacer, but there should be enough to make things interesting. I reckon this thing's going to affect the air-fuel ratio, and perhaps a few other things. Before we can put the carburetor back on the engine, I have to make a new gasket. A few episodes ago, some folks doubted I had the ability to make a gasket. You know, I somehow managed to put a lawnmower engine in the car. I'm pretty sure I can make a gasket when I want to. Well, this one ain't going to be perfect, but it'll be good enough for what we want. So this 670cc engine is very popular and there are all kinds of performance parts available for it. Of course, there are several different kinds of carburetors you can get for it, including twin Makuni carburetors. You know, other channels like Redbeard's Garage and Cars and Cameras do a lot of that stuff. And of course, those are very interesting videos. I could just buy a carburetor kit and install it and not do any of these experiments, but that's sort of what makes my channel different. Now, there's nothing wrong with buying parts, but in order to understand how to interpret the effects different parts will have on the way the engine operates, sometimes it's good to play around with what you already got. Now, I'm just having some fun, and I pretty much have an idea what to expect, but you never know. Now, for me, it's nothing to 3D print a part and install it and see what it does. I'm sure a lot of folks are interested in doing stuff just to see what happens. Now in this car, we're not dealing with a lot of power to begin with, and it's easy to validate what works and what doesn't. At the end of the day, no matter what we do to this car, it'll never be as fast as the Geo Metro. So why not take the time and explore the possibilities and have some fun? So apparently the spacer we installed between the carburetor and the manifold changes the way the air filter fits. Now this is a decent air filter, and it doesn't appear to be restrictive, and there's no reason we need to upgrade. But I do have plenty of these 60 millimeter filters around, so let's 3D print the part that we need to make this filter fit the engine. Now, once again, there are filter upgrade kits available for these engines, and something like that would be real easy to buy, but since this is just an experiment, there's no need to buy stuff we may use only once or twice. The 3D printed part we're making is from ASA plastic, which will be plenty strong and can handle the heat no problem. So this is actually something I designed myself with Tinkercad. A lot of the time you can check around and various websites have 3D models available to download for free. It just so happened I couldn't find something for a 60mm air filter on a 670cc V-twin engine, so I designed my own. This one took about an hour to design and 9 hours to print. Well, I reckon we need to take the car out for a spin and see how the engine likes the cross-flow spacer. Ah, it's good to be back behind the wheel of this ugly little car. <laughs> so right away I can tell the air-fuel ratio is a bit richer, but the engine seems to run fine. At this point, it's hard to tell what effect the cross-flow spacer has while driving around town as far as power goes. But before we get too carried away, we need to modify the jets in the carburetor to lean out the mixture, that's for sure. Let's head out of town and see how the high-speed driving affects the air-fuel ratio. Yup, the air-fuel ratio is just way too rich. The engine is running between the high 9s and the low 10s, so at this point we know the cross-flow spacer affects the air-fuel ratio by causing the engine to run rich. That's not a big deal, we can fix that. This carburetor has a few things that can be adjusted or modified, however, we only have the parts to modify the main jets, so that's what we'll do. Now, this engine came with a bunch of extra jets for altitude compensation, and these extra jets are drilled way too small, and they're more or less useless. But, they can be modified by drilling them out. The set of jets that are currently in the carburetor are drilled out to 1.09 mm or thereabouts. This drill bit set ain't exactly accurate, and the color code doesn't match the size indicated by the manufacturer. So, it's more or less a guessing game. What we do know is the current jets in the carburetor were drilled out with this bit, and I reckon we should go one size down and try this bit. And, depending on how it's measured, this bit is about 1.06 millimeter. So drilling these jets out is very tricky, and it's easy to bust the drill bit, but with some practice it can be done. 
Now off camera, I already drilled the jets out and it takes a while, but I like to make it look easy. Now all we have to do is put these jets in the carburetor and we can do some more testing. Now I forgot to mention, this fuel shutoff solenoid has been disabled. This thing isn't really necessary and its main purpose is to prevent backfires in the exhaust when the engine's turned off. Now these solenoids do fail and when they do the engine won't run at all. So the easy thing to do is to remove the solenoid and pull the spring and plunger out and then put the solenoid back into the carburetor. All right, we're back on the road. This time around, the air-fuel ratio is between 12.7 and 13.5 while cruising. So, it looks like we're in the right neighborhood. Off camera, we went ahead and did a fuel economy test. Now, for this test and the previous test, we kept the car between 50 and 55 miles per hour and only used third or fourth gear on the transmission. Anyway, we covered 37.1 miles and consumed 0.911 gallons of gasoline and that works out to 40.72 miles to the gallon. That's up quite a bit from our previous attempt, which resulted in 35.5 miles to the gallon. For the new viewers, well, this car is fitted with a tiny 2.5 gallon fuel tank, and our method of checking the fuel that was consumed is very accurate, so no worries. Apparently, we did make some progress today. Well, it's that time again where we validate our work with the 0 to 55 acceleration test. We'll be starting off in third gear so we don't have to waste time shifting the transmission and the time to beat is 34.22 seconds. So that was interesting. I kind of figured we wouldn't do so well, but it looks like we shaved almost a full second off our time. So a couple of things. First of all, the car didn't launch as hard as it normally does. It was kind of soft. Now, I did go back and look at last week's data, and this time around the car was a split second slower all the way up to 50 miles per hour. After that, the car started picking up speed. Now, of course, we're dealing with two changes. The first one is the cross-flow spacer, and the second one is we leaned out the mixture. So it's hard to say which one helped or hurt performance. I do know this. The off-idle throttle response is not as sharp as it used to be, and that may account for the soft launch. Now, this gauge is impossible to read on video, but from the driver's seat, I could see the air-fuel ratio was floating between 12.5 and 13.2, which is pretty good for making power on a water-cooled engine, but I feel it's a bit lean for an air-cooled engine, and I think I'd rather see the air-fuel ratio between 12 and 12 and a half. Now, fuel consumption's also interesting. We saw a significant improvement, but did the cross-flow spacer help, or perhaps without it would we have seen even better fuel economy? Hmm. Now, unfortunately, this was a short week and we only had four days to make this video. I'm wondering if we need to have a second look. Now, I know the fuel economy folks are happy that we made an improvement, but I'm still not sure where the improvement came from. And on the other hand, even though we set a new speed record, I feel the engine just wasn't pulling as hard. Naturally, I want to dig deeper into this because I really want to know what's going on. Now, I'm sure a lot of you folks have opinions and theories, but keep in mind, testing is the only way to find out for sure. Hmm. Well, at least this was a fun experiment, and this little car is always a joy to drive. Thanks for taking the time to watch this week, and until next time.